Good afternoon. My name is Rashawn Stevens. I'm the president of Bail Laws Veteran and Military Leave Society. And we want to welcome you today to our Veterans Day luncheon, as well as our professional uh, development program. At this time, we have remarks by our Dean, Dean Tobin. <laughs> Thank you, Rashawn. The 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, the year is 1918, the armistice goes into effect, ending hostilities in World War I. The following year, 1919, President Woodrow Wilson declared Armistice Day to be a national holiday recognizing not only the cessation of hostilities in World War I, but also recognizing the service of all those who suffered, were wounded, and died in World War I, that terrible conflagration that went across Europe for so many years. At Baylor Law School, we honor the armed forces. Last Saturday, we had our fall commencement ceremonies. And uh, at the commencement ceremonies, we were pleased to have President Lyndon Livingstone preside. Uh, President Livingstone is with us today, along with Mr. Brad Livingstone, the first gent of Baylor University. I, at the commencement ceremony, told the audience that Veterans Day was going to occur this week. I very quickly added, though, that for those who have been at our many commencements over the many years, we have four a year, that I was about to do something that we do at every commencement, and we were not doing it simply because Veterans Day was a few days away. And that is, we begin our ceremonies at commencement by acknowledging the service of all those who have given to our country so that our country has protection, that the free world has protection across the globe. I also note to the audience, as I am now, that oftentimes we overlook the symbiotic relationship between the legal profession and our armed forces. In the legal profession, we are stewards of the rule of law. We are the guardians of the justice system. We would not be able, in our profession, to be stewards and guardians were it not for the cloak of security that is provided across the nation and around the globe that allows us to practice our profession, that allows us to stand for those who seek justice in our system. And today, I'm going to begin by doing then what I do at commencement. I want all members of the military, active, retired, or reserved, please stand and receive our appreciation.
Veterans Clinic, which also serves first responders, has been a recipient of some of those many awards of our clinic's program. And Professor Fusilier also has been personally awarded a recognition, very, uh, a, a very prestigious recognition by the State Bar of Texas for her work in establishing the Veterans Clinic, but also her work in being a voice for veterans here at Baylor Law School and well beyond. Today, we have a distinct honor. We have Admiral John Hannock. I enjoy reading military history, and I must say I knew Admiral Hannock when he was a student here. And I recall when I first got word that John was now Admiral Hannock. I was like a kid. <laughs> wow. We have a fleet officer, an admiral, among our alumni. Admiral Hannon, Baylor lawyer, but we always say class capital B, capital L, because it's not just a descriptor, it is a brand. Admiral Hannon has distinguished himself in a long career of service to our nation. Uh, you are the embodiment, you are the epitome of what it means to step forward, to give one's service, to give one's life, to give one's career to others so that we enjoy the security and the freedoms here in the United States and others enjoy those freedoms, as I've noted, around the globe. Let me give you a introduction of Admiral Hannock's career. Admiral Hannock is a 1985 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. He completed his pilot training at the Naval Air Station in Kingsville, Texas. While he was assigned to Sea Control Squadron 33, he deployed to the Western Pacific and Indian Oceans aboard the USS Nimitz. Of course, we take pride here in Texas, uh, the home of Fredericksburg of Admiral Nimitz. He served as the squadron's public affairs officer, quality assurance officer, and as its nuclear safety officer. The Admiral then entered the Navy's legal education program and graduated from Baylor Law School in 1994. Thereafter, he earned a Master's of Law degree in international law at the George Washington School of Law. The Admiral completed several assignments within the Naval Legal Service Command in the Office of the Judge Advocate General. His service command assignments included representation of personnel in various matters, serving as a prosecutor at the Naval Station in San Diego, and serving as commanding officer of the regional legal service offices. His assignments in the office of the Judge Advocate General included general litigation, and he served as the executive assistant to the Deputy Judge Advocate General and the Judge Advocate General. The Admiral's operational experience included serving as Deputy and Judge Advocate for the U.S. Fifth Fleet, the Staff Judge Advocate for the U.S. Second Fleet, the Special Assistant to the Secretary of the Navy, the Deputy Legal Counsel to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Special Counsel to the Chief of Naval Operations, and the Staff Advocate for the U.S. Pacific Command. The Admiral also served as a Fellow on the Chief of Naval Operations Strategic Study Group coming out of Newport, Rhode Island. Admiral Hannock served from 2015 to 2018 as the Deputy Judge Advocate General of the Navy and Commander of the Naval Legal Service Command. As Commander, he led the Judge Advocates, enlisted lawyers, and the civilian employees of 14 commands worldwide, providing prosecution and defense services, legal assistance to individuals, and legal support to both shore and afloat commands. The Admiral was the 44th Judge Advocate General of the Navy. That's a big deal. He also was the Principal Military Legal Counsel to the Secretary of the Navy and the Chief of Naval Operations. He led the 20 
300, 2,300 lawyers in the command. Just think of that. We think of big law. We get impressed when big law has 500, 700, 800 lawyers in a firm. 2,300 in the admiral's firm. His military awards include the Defense Superior Service Medal, the Legion of Merit, and the Meritorious Service Medal. Admiral Hannock, you have our admiration, you have our adulation, you have our respect, and you have our deep gratitude for your career. Please come and share remarks. Thank you, uh, Dean and uh, President Lincoln Stone, Brad. Um, great to be here with you and uh, Sean for extending the invitation. Uh, I'm deeply uh, grateful to you for that. And let me start with a quick story. Um, about a decade ago, I was in charge of all the operations and management functions for the Navy JAG Corps. Um, and that included overseeing all the prosecution uh, offices that, that do the court martial prosecution. And we were trying to strengthen our career litigation track. Uh, we were realigning some office functions. Um, and as we looked at which lawyers we could place where, we knew that we didn't have enough senior experienced lawyers to go around. And so we would need to call upon some of the more junior attorneys to step up and take some of the more challenging cases. And I saw the list of the proposed distribution of lawyers between the prosecutors and the defense counsel. And on that list, I saw the name of Ashley Stubbins, whose name I recognized as being a Baylor law grad in 2011. Now, I was on the phone with the chief of the prosecution office down in Norfolk, Captain Wilson. Uh, we were talking about who would be a prosecutor, who would be a defense counsel. And I said to him something like, the numbers may not be ideal, but you're getting Ashley Stevens, and she has an unfair advantage in court. And there was silence on the line. Now I knew that Captain Wilson wouldn't understand. And so I just waited. So he asked, what do you mean an unfair advantage in the court? Well, I said slowly with a smile on my face that I knew he couldn't see. She went to bail. Well, Lieutenant Stebbins Clayton is now in the rank of commander. She's one of the most proficient Navy litigators. And when I retired a year ago, Captain Wilson was promoted to her admiral. And he saw her performance. And every single time I run into him now, he looks at me and he smiles. And he says, she went to Baylor. <laughs> so you guys are in the right place. And it's a real privilege for me to come back to Baylor Law. I learned a lot here. One thing that I came to appreciate more than I had before was the importance of history. Now, this came mostly from my classes with Professor David Gwynn, recently reported. He taught me constitutional law and civil rights. And if you were a student at the time, you knew that his classes usually started with him well outside the class. He would be walking down the hall, and uh, before he got that close, you would hear his voice talking in normal lecture tones. His finger would be snapping, and in the door he would walk already partway through a story, a really a backstory, that would shed some new light on the cases that we were reading. Sometimes the new light was on the judges involved in the case. Sometimes the new light was on significant events from the nation's past. But most often, the new light was on the people affected by the case. 
showing their underlying humanity and making us think twice about any preconceived notion or stereotype. Now, after I graduated from the Navy, uh, from here, returned to the Navy, my appreciation of history continued. And over time, I came to understand this, that history can be a blessing, it can also be a burden. History can bring great pride, it can inspire, but it can also shame. And so it's important to understand it. Not to spin it, not to twist it to our own uses, but to learn from it. So that we can decide on our intended path for the future. And so, as I invite you to reflect on Veterans Day, I'd like to do that. I'd like to start with a bit of history. I want to think about the veterans from the past, and then talk a bit about the veterans of the present, and then close with the veterans of the future. But Dean Talbot talked about the beginning of Veterans Day, how November 11, 1918, marked the armistice on the Western Front. It was the 11th hour, the 11th day, when the war that was so brutal on the body and brutalizing on the soul finally came to an end. Armistice was signed about 5 o'clock in the morning. Paris time, but it would take some time for word to filter out to the troops to make an armistice effective. And so it became effective at 11 o'clock, and that was fitting. Because for a certain number of the troops, it really was. It really was the 11th hour. The day before, about 2,500 lost their lives. And were it not for the armistice kicking in at the 11th hour, more lost lives for the fall. Now, the last U.S. veteran from World War I, a gentleman by the name of Frank Buckles, died in 2018, 110 years old. So the last of that generation is gone, and we remember them today. But even as World War I was ending, the next generation of American veterans was being born, a generation that would take our nation, to take our allies through World War II. One of those was born right here in Waco, 1919. I hope you've all heard the story. It's a story depicted by a wonderful Riverside Monument, about exactly one mile from this place. And if you've looked at the story, you know how uh, Dory Miller enlisted in the Navy in 1939. Based on his race, he was only allowed to train as a cook and a cleaner. But yet, two years later, he found himself assigned to the USS West Virginia, moored on Battleship Row in Pearl Harbor. And it was December 7, 1941. If you know the story, you know how he responded with clear eyed, warrior like action as the attacking pilot scored hits with the bombs and torpedoes. Dory went to his battle station, but that part of the ship was already destroyed. So he pitched in elsewhere, first saving the wounded, and then manning machine gun, for which he had no training, returning fire and downing several of the attacking aircraft. The crew fought hard, but in the end, all they could do was open some compartments, scuttle the ship, and let it sink upright to the bottom. Now, for that, Dory Miller received a pretty prestigious award. It's called the Navy Cross. And he came home stateside to sell war bonds. But there was going to be little respite for him, because this was a war that needed all hands. So most people don't know that he went back out to sea. This time, he was on a small aircraft carrier, the USS Liscombe Bay. And almost exactly two years after Pearl Harbor, the ship was shot out from under him once again. This time it was the victim of a Japanese submarine with a well-placed torpedo that detonated the carrier's own supply of bombs and torpedoes. A big explosion. And this time Dory Miller didn't survive. He was among two-thirds of the <coughs> who never recovered. So 
we remember him today, just like we honor him every year on the Lord. I want to add to Dora Miller's story with the story of another World War II veteran. There's some similarities and there's some differences. I'm going to call this guy Harm. H A R M. I'm also going to call him my uncle because that's what it was. One of my dad's older brothers. Like Dory, he enlisted, but he went in the Army in 1939. Now he's from California, and I don't know the full story, but somehow he ended up at an Army recruiting station in Oregon. Why did he join? Well, later he said, where else could a young man get three room and four and a chance to see the world? So this was August 1939. And Harm didn't know, he couldn't know what was in store for our nation. The nation was growing. So after basic training uh, on Angel Island in San Francisco Bay, he was uh, reassigned to Fort Drum. Not the Fort Drum in upstate New York. Uh, the Fort Drum that's located about 1,000 miles across the Pacific, out in the Philippines, at the entrance to Manila Bay, a small fort. It sounds like an army base, but in all actuality, it was more like an Navy ship. Because what it was was a, a rock. It was a big rock. And decades before, the engineers had blasted the top off of that rock. As its widest is about 140 feet, about 350 feet in length. And they built a steel and concrete fortress with walls 20 to 30 feet thick. The troops called it a concrete battleship, because that's what it looked like. It's bow pointed away from the harbor, out towards the south of China Sea. And my uncle was assigned to one pair of the big 14-inch guns on Fort Drum. And he was there when Dory Miller was attacked at Pearl Harbor. And the next attack came for him in the Philippines. The guns of Fort Drum supported the troops who were trying to defend Bataan against the invading Japanese. And when Bataan fell, those guns continued to fire, but eventually, Low on food, water, and ammunition. All remaining U.S. personnel in the Philippines were ordered to surrender. They had 30 minutes to destroy their gear, render the big guns useless, and throw their rifles into the sea. So, this is how my uncle described that experience. 12 o'clock sharp on May 6, 1942. Our United States flag was pulled out. And a white sheet, the flag of surrender, was hoisted. I don't know what that means to other people. But when our flag came down, and that white sheet went up, a feeling of complete sorrow came over me. Seemed we not done our job. With heavy hearts, we were aware that our lives hung in the balance. We knew that our hours of freedom were numbered. Their hours of freedom were numbered indeed. Although my uncle missed the Bataan Death March, he suffered similar indignities. Through it all, he helped his buddies. His buddies helped him. That's how they survived. First was a guy named Les Fong. Then, when Harm and Les were separated after about three and a half months, there was a guy he remembered only as Reddy. They needed every ounce of teamwork and every ounce of camaraderie. Like Harm said, the man who didn't share very well likely could make it through. So about a year later, August 1943, he was shipped off to Japan to work in the coal mines. Little food, disease rampant, intermittent punishment, senseless physical and mental torture, all that took its toll. 
And I'm out to survive that for two more years. And at his 11th hour, he was free for the end of the war in August 1945. Now, like all troops from World War II, he was welcome out. I say all troops, but we really know that wasn't the case. For many, those who looked more like Dory Miller than a harm hammock, they may have been some things. But outside of family and friends, the warm welcome from the nation as a whole wasn't there. Physically, things weren't easy for harm. He spent another two years in a series of hospitals. Patiently worked his way from seeing his name on the list of terminally ill patients to where finally he was well enough to go home. And it also knew that while he was healing, millions of his fellow veterans were also returning home. They went to work, they went to school on the GI Bill, they started changing our nation for the better. And he was okay with that. Because not everybody who serves makes the same sacrifice. I almost said that when he left for the Philippines in 1940, many Americans were poor. But when he returned in 1945, even though there was a war that was going on, it seemed a lot more prosperous. So people could buy not just necessities, but luxuries as well. America has a way of changing, sometimes slowly, but sometimes fast. And he said that for a physically and emotionally completed form of prisoner of war, adjusting to this new American way was difficult. So my uncle Harm left the war, but the war never fully left him. Now don't get me wrong, he was grateful for every day. He was grateful for friends, for family, for community. But he wasn't so grateful for the nights. When his experiences would flash back through his mind and activate his body, letting him know the effects of his service were still there. He didn't talk much about it. But near the end, as his wife made a record of his experiences, he was adamant that he was never sorry he went through it. After all, it was part of what made him who he was. Now, my uncle stayed involved in veterans groups, passed away in 1989, four years after seeing one of his sons and one of his nephews. So what about veterans of the present? Well, there's a few World War II veterans still alive, a few more from Korea. But most older veterans today are from the Vietnam era. Many in their 70s. Even those who were young, who saw the fall of Saigon in 1975 or well in their 60s. And they too saw America change. They saw a nation struggling with the rationale for the war. And as Americans watched the war evolve on the TV screens, the nightly news, they wondered, often rightly, what would victory look like? Was victory even possible? How long should we keep trying? But too many Americans let the debates and the doubts sometimes discussed get transferred from the fact of war itself to the faces of those who fought. We forgot that those who fought it didn't choose the war. 
information that's simple. As one writer put it, society as a whole was unable and unwilling to receive these men with support and understanding they needed. The most common experiences of rejection were not explicit acts of hostility, but quieter, sometimes more devastating forms of withdrawal, suspicion, and indifference. How different it was just 15 years later, after the American-led coalition defeated Iraqi forces in Kuwait during the 1991 Gulf War. Maybe it was a clear victory and a clear moral purpose that once again endeared the American public to their veterans. But maybe too, Americans have learned from their history and collectively decided that they had to set a different path for veterans coming up. This renewed willingness to support the troops and honor the veterans finally brought some long delayed recognition to those who had rushed aside after Vietnam. And since 9 11, a whole generation the veterans has served in complex and challenging circumstances. So here's the truth. Their actions have been no less heroic than during them. Their sacrifices have been no less complete than our men. The fact is we've had another greatest generation. And even though the context of their fighting has not always been clear. The appreciation and support from the American public has no way. You need proof. I don't look around on this Veterans Day. And you can see that it's free food Friday. Many restaurants serving veterans, no charge. Now, I heard something under the Yeah, now everybody at law school probably thinks all this food out here is free. But if you were at the business school, they'd tell you it's not free. It's just included. <laughs> <laughs> but there's also hundreds and maybe thousands of group efforts like the Baylor Law Veterans Clinic doing what they can to reach veterans who's ever within their span of influence and do some good. Universities like Baylor actively seek out veterans and support them for their study. There are services to help veterans and their spouses with employment. Retired Marine Corps General and former Secretary of Defense James Mattis has helped remind me that the challenges of military service don't make veterans damaged goods. We've all heard about post-traumatic stress General Mattis also talks about post-traumatic growth that can make veterans feel kinder toward their fellow human beings. And it reminds us that just like any challenge in life, service helps create eager and ready students, dedicated business owners and employees, and most importantly, strong citizens. Just as importantly, there are unceasing efforts to ensure that no veteran is left to suffer in silence, to break the stigma on receiving mental health care. You know, seeing all this, I'm reminded of a question you'll know is being recorded in the good book. A question posed long ago by an expert in the law to someone who knew a thing or two about service. But who is my neighbor? Now the full and complete answer to that question, of course, is the parable of the Good Samaritan. But how America treats its veterans today is a pretty good story. Now what does this mean? 
mean for veterans of the future? Well, let me make three observations. First is, our nation will need future veterans. Not just those in uniform today, but those who will join tomorrow. For almost 50 years now, we've relied only on volunteers. We've relied only on people who will step up and who will say, I will serve you. And in that environment, it can be easy for people to look around and leave responsibility to others. Now, not everybody can serve in uniform. Not everybody should. But the possibility should be considered be explored, along with the many other avenues available for national and public service. And it goes for lawyers, too. As the dean said, maybe especially lawyers. There's so many ways for us to make a difference. Our second observation, something I used to remind the lawyers of the Navy Jack were about, and that's because we have an all-volunteer force. We can't make anybody join and we can't make anybody stay. So if we want people to join, and if we want people to stay, if we want a good and strong and capable team, well, people have to be treated right. They don't need to be coddled. They don't want to be coddled. Most signed up for a challenge. They crave a good challenge. But when they sacrifice, it should be acknowledged. When you have individual skills to contribute, those skills need to be used to enhance the team. And whether they exceed the goal or fall short, in being judged, they deserve to feel a sense of fairness and a sense of justice. People and teamwork, they still make all the difference. Dory Miller knew it. So today, when your military takes steps to forge stronger teams, to get people talking more and working together, even on controversial issues, it's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of willingness to understand our history and to build the trust and the teamwork that's needed to prevail in the future. Now, my last observation is this. It's what I'd say to veterans of the future. I would say my season of service was immensely gratifying. I was willing to sacrifice. The fact is, compared to many, I'm insignificant. I invested a lot, but I received so much more in return. Along the way, I hope I help make things better for others. Now, if you join, the service is going to change you. It will shape you. But you will also have the chance to shape the service, to help the people around you, and the chance to help change America for the better. You won't just learn from history. You'll help make history. Now let me close with a request. And it is as you complete your personal meditation on this veteran's day. Please remember. And tonight, like every night, many of our service members are deployed at sea and overseas. They're away from home, away from family. But if nobody's missing from our home, if nobody's missing from our family, it can be easy to forget. And yet their service is what enables us to maintain 
has advanced principles of freedom. So remember, we're sacrificed. And rededicate yourself to spreading the benefits of freedom and liberty within your people and throughout our nation. We talk about you back. Recognize 
the anniversary of our veterans claim. Um, so as I name these names off for you all, please uh, make your way down. First, President and Mr. Livingston. Next, Professor Fusilier, Dean Tobin, Zane Thomas, SBA, Nick Texera, Ed Nelson, Josh Bergo, Professor Greg White, and Rick Soul. At this time, this completes uh, this afternoon's veteran service. We thank you all for attending, and uh, we wish you safe, tri safe travels this weekend. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I have one quick admin note, last one. I'd be remiss if I did not uh, fully acknowledge and encourage everyone to attend the game that I believe is sold out tomorrow. Um, it is our salute to service game and it will be aired on ESPN. And at halftime, they will be recognizing our guest speaker, John Hannon, at halftime uh, on the field. So we encourage you all to tune in.